Hi, welcome. In these last two webcasts, I've looked at uncertainty as something that we, we're not comfortable with when we value companies. We don't like to deal with uncertainty. So I'd like to talk about a tool that I found to be useful in dealing with uncertainty in a little more healthy way than I would otherwise, and that's Monte Carlo simulations. To understand simulations, I'm going to take you back in time to the origins of financial analysis, at least as we know it. If you think about a typical capital budgeting or a typical valuation, here's what we're trained to do. We're asked to make our best estimates given the data we have for each input variable. So if you're valuing a company, you might be asked, what's the revenue growth going to be? And you're allowed a single number, 3% revenue growth. What's your margin going to be? 15%. And what the valuation is built on are these point estimates, and you get a single value for the company. But if you're, if, you're, if you're like me, each time you have to give one of those numbers, part of you is screaming, but I'm not sure. I could be wrong. There's not much you can do about it in traditional financial analysis, but let me offer you an alternative. What if instead of giving a point estimate for each variable, I allowed you to give me a distribution? You're saying, what are you talking about? With revenue growth, rather than tell me the revenue growth is 3%, what if you could tell me that it's uniformly distributed between minus 3% and plus 9%? And instead of giving me a margin of 15%, what if you told me that it was normally distributed with an expected value of 15% and a standard deviation of 4%? That's closer to honesty, right? Because you are uncertain about those variables. You say, what are you going to do with those, with those distributions? What if I went in and plucked one, out, one outcome out of each distribution? So out of the revenue growth, I pick a number. It's going to be between minus 3 and plus 9, obviously, but let's say I get plus 7%. I go into the margin and I pick, the sec I pick a number. It could be 12%. I value the company. And then I do it again and again and again. Each time I run a simulation, I'm picking an outcome out of a, out of a property distribution and valuing the company. And I'm getting a different value. At the end of my simulations, I'm going to have a distribution of values for my company rather than a single expected value. So rather than tell you, that the value of your company is $30, $35 per share, I'll give you a distribution with an expected value around 35. Why? Because I'm building it around the same base case expected values for the variables, but I could give you a distribution for that value. That's what a simulation allows you to do. 30 years ago, this would have been almost impossible for you to do as a financial analyst without access to incredibly expensive machine power and lots of data. Today, I think, any one of us can do a simulation. And my objective in this webcast is take you through that process of running a simulation. So let's start by doing some homework. Before you start running simulations, here's what I'd like you to think about. Not all uncertainty is created equal, and I'd like you to think about classifying uncertainty. First, into discrete and continuous uncertainty. Discrete uncertainty takes on zero one outcomes. It can happen or it cannot happen. Example, you're valuing a Venezuelan company or worried about nationalization. Nationalization either happens or doesn't. It's a zero-one risk. You're investing in a country with fixed exchange rates. Either the exchange rates stay fixed or you could have a devaluation. That's a discrete risk. You invest in a country with floating exchange rates. You're exposed to risk all of the time. That's continuous risk. Discrete versus continuous risk. Your uncertainties can be symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetric uncertainties, the outcomes around the expected value, are just as likely to be positive as negative, and the magnitudes are roughly the same. A classic symmetric distribution, of course, is the normal distribution, that distribution we all are so fond of after statistics classes. In an asymmetric distribution, one side of the distribution is more likely to see large outcomes than the other. An example, let's assume that you could invest your money in a company. The worst that can happen is you lose all of your money. You're saying that's bad enough, it's minus 100%. But let's say your best case scenario is you could make 800 or 900%. That's a distribution that's called positively skewed because the outcomes are more likely to be big positive numbers than big negative numbers. On the other side, you could have a distribution where you're more likely to see a big negative outcome than a large positive outcome. So as an example, let's say you don't insure your apartment or your house. Well, if it burns down, you lose the entire house. But if it doesn't burn down, you do save yourself that insurance money every month or every year. That's a negatively skewed distribution. Symmetric versus asymmetric distribution. The third thing to think about with uncertainties is those outcomes that are very different from your expected value. 
How likely are they to happen? If the likelihood is very, very small, you've got a thin tail distribution. In a classic normal distribution, the tails are thin tails. In contrast, if your outcomes which are very different from the expected value are, far, are, are more likely to happen, larger probabilities, you have a fat tail distribution. Now you're saying this is inside statistics. I'm not interested. You're going to see why you care about this classification in a minute. Because here are the steps in running a simulation. The first step is to actually do the valuation as if you're not going to do a simulation. Do an expected value, a base case valuation. Not a conservative estimate of value, but an expected value. Second step, identify the key value drivers. That sounds fancy, but basically I'm asking of all the inputs you put into evaluation, which ones drive the value the most? You're saying, how the heck would I know? There are two ways you can answer it. One is you can take the variables, change them, and see which ones have the biggest effect on value. The second is, you can check to see what investors in that company seem to be most in disagreement about, most worried about. If that variable is revenue growth or if it's margin, you should focus on that variable. So identify the value drivers. Third step, go collect data. Not just on the company and its history, which is always a good place to start, but also across companies in the sector that your company is in. So if your company is a software company and you're looking at margins, why not look at margins across software companies to get a sense of what's low, what's high, what's typical in that sector. Collect the data. Then comes a key step. You've got to fit probability distributions to each of your value drivers and, and pick parameters for that distribution. So take an easy one. Let's assume you've decided that a particular variable is going to be normally distributed. You're essentially picking a symmetric distribution with thin tails. I hope that fits. You've got to give me an expected value and a standard deviation for that distribution. Those are all the things you need for a normal distribution. So for each variable, pick a distribution in the parameters. You're almost there. Stop and check to see whether there are any constraints you want into the, into the process and any correlations across the variables. What am I talking about? Let's say you're valuing a company like Valiant where there is a worry that the company might not be able to make its debt payments. The constraint you might want to build in is if the value of the business falls below the outstanding debt, your equity goes to zero. Let's say you're valuing a bank and you're worried about regulatory capital ratios being breached. You can build that in as a constraint. Correlations are across variables. So if your key value drivers are revenue growth and margins, you might want to consider whether revenue growth is, when revenue growth is high, margins also tend to be high or whether they tend to be low. That's a correlation you can build across variables, an advantage you have with simulations. You're ready. Now run the simulations, as many as you can. Each time you run a simulation, you're going to get a value for the company. Develop a value distribution for the company. Look at what's high, what's low. There's your best case and worst case already in your simulation. Get your expected values. Get all the moments of the distribution of 1, 2. I find it very useful. Look at the percentiles, the 10th percentile, the 20th percentile, the 30th percentile. Then you have the basis for a decision. You ready? Let's try this. The company I'm going to use for my simulation is Apple. And this is a valuation I did right after its most recent earnings report, which was a bit of a disappointment to the market because Apple, for the first time in almost a decade, reported negative revenue growth. So people are worried about Apple going forward. So I decided to do a valuation of Apple in May of 2016. And this is my base case. Remember again, this is not my conservative valuation. This is my base case valuation. In my base case valuation, here are my key assumptions. My expected revenue growth going forward is going to be 1.5% a year. That's lower than the growth rate of the economy. My story for Apple that is that it's a beyond mature company with competition eating away into its margins, but it's got the substantial cash balance that, gives, that acts as a ballast on its value. So the revenue growth is going to be 1.5%. I'm going to expect margins, which are right now 33%, to continue to drift down, not dramatically, because as you can see, the margins have been pretty robust, to 25% over the next decade. I've also assumed that they will need to reinvest a dollar for every dollar 60 in revenues that they expect to generate. Now, that I base that on the, on the entire sector because Apple's own numbers are a little off kilter because of its big cash balance. I gave Apple a pretty high cost of capital, 9.63%. percent you saying high relative to what? Well, that's in a, at about the 80th percentile for U.S. companies, reflecting my concerns about the fact that Apple, in spite of its size and its great margins, is a technology company and is subject to sudden shifts. 
So with those big variables, with those big assumptions, the value that I got for Apple was about $126. That's higher than the stock price at the time. In fact, when I did this valuation, the stock price was about 93 I could have stopped right there and said, I'm buying Apple, and I have no qualms about doing that, but I decided that this would be a good test case to do a simulation. So second step in the process, I wanted to identify the key value drivers for Apple. And one of the reasons I made my valuation parsimonious. Parsimonious in what sense? If you look at the valuation, the base case, there are only four big assumptions I made. Revenue growth, margins, sales to capital that determines my reinvestment, and my cost to capital. So I changed each of those four variables to see which ones affected my value the most. Hey, and I, it was, the results were pretty stark. Revenue growth and operating margins had big impacts on my value. The sales to capital ratio had almost no impact because the revenue growth is so low that reinvestment is not a big factor and the cost of capital has almost no impact either. So I decided to build my valuation around revenue growth and operating margin being my value drivers. Incidentally, of those two inputs, I think revenue growth is the bigger value driver because at least in May of 2016, it's the number that people seem to be most in disagreement about. There is some who look at the last, most recent quarterly report and are convinced that Apple is in decline, that revenue growth is going to become negative. There are others who feel that you're just one more iPhone model away from returning to healthy revenue growth. So I'm going to focus in on revenue growth and operating margins, and I went out and collected data. I started by looking at Apple's own numbers annually going back to 1989, the annual revenue growth number and the operating margin number each year. Now, if you look across the time period, you can see Apple has had a pretty rocky 27 years. It had its near-death experience in the 1990s, and of course, Steve Jobs came back in his second iteration at Apple. He turned the company around. The rest, as they say, is corporate history. And you could see the buildup of Apple over the last decade with the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. But one interesting feature of this annual data is that during this entire time period, revenue growth and operating margins have tended to move together. In fact, the correlation between the two numbers is 0.63. What does that mean? When revenue growth is high, operating margins tend to be high as well. Now, of course, you're looking at this and saying, but this isn't the Apple I know. It's a different company. And you're right. The iPhone changed the Apple. This is the iPhone decade, the last decade, and what I've done here is focused on revenue growth on a year-on-year -year basis. So the third quarter of 2009 is compared to the third quarter of 2008 and the operating margin each quarter. With the iPhone model superimposed, so you can see the effect of each new iPhone generation being introduced at Apple and how it's affecting Apple's revenue growth and margins. The results are pretty interesting. Each iPhone, when introduced, pushes up revenue growth in the three or four quarters after, and then you see a pretty rapid drop-off. So Apple is a company that increasingly has been hooked into the iPhone life and death sequence driving its revenue growth. There is an interesting trend over time. Each consecutive iPhone generation has had a smaller impact than the previous one as Apple's become a larger and larger company. Now, what does this tell me about the future? The iPhone 7 will create a revenue impact, obviously. But the revenue growth from the iPhone 7 is going to be smaller than it was in the iPhone 6, which was smaller than it was in the iPhone 5. So I wouldn't be surprised if the iPhone 7 created revenue growth of only 8 to 10%. Now, that's still good. So my expected revenue growth of 1.5% does allow for future iPhone and other new devices. But it's basically saying those the growth rates you're going to see are going to be smaller than they were in the past. Now, I also looked across the tech sector. And I focused on aging technology companies. These are companies, technology companies that have been around more than 25 years. And there are about 343 companies just in the U.S. I looked at the revenue growth over the last 10 years, the compounded annual revenue growth, just to get a sense of what revenue growth looks like at an old tech company. And in 26% of these companies, revenue growth was negative. But it's also interesting that a fairly significant subset of these companies still were able to maintain revenue growth that exceeded 10%. So what that tells you is with aging tech companies, you are far more likely to see negative revenue growth. But there are a few that hold out that still manage to have high revenue growth in spite of the fact that they're older tech companies. These are all going to play into my choice of property distributions. And this picture is my attempt to keep things simple. 
Simple in what sense? Well, remember the three breakdowns for uncertainty, discrete versus continuous, symmetric versus asymmetric, thin tail versus fat tail. This is my attempt, given the kind of risk you face, as to what kind of distribution might work best for you. Now, this isn't a comprehensive list. There are 55, 60 distributions just in crystal ball that you can pick from. But this works pretty well for me if I have to pick a prob probability distribution for a particular variable. And it includes discrete and continuous distributions. And that's what I drew on when I decided to pick a distribution for Apple's revenue growth and margin. For Apple's revenue growth, I went with a log normal distribution. You're saying, why? Because I think that if you're going to get big outcomes that are different from my expected value, one and a half percent, they're more likely to be positive than negative. In other words, I am building in a likelihood that Apple's revenue growth could be negative and a fairly significant likelihood that could be minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four percent. But I don't see it becoming minus 15 percent. But there is still an outside chance that if Apple could find a way to disrupt a really big market, now leave it out your, to your imagination what that market might be, that its revenue growth might go back to eight or nine or 10 percent. So that's why I picked the log normal distribution. As to how I picked the parameters, I'll make a confession. I played with those parameters till I got a distribution that reflected what I'd learned from the data, what a big neg what a big negative outcome would be and what a big positive outcome would be. And this was my end result. For margin, I feel a little more confident that my target margin of 25% is going to be the center of the distribution and I picked a triangular distribution. Now you might not be as comfortable with or familiar with a triangular as a normal distribution, but a triangular distribution has a couple of advantages over the normal. In a normal distribution, if you look at the tails, your margin can become minus infinity or plus infinity, which are both infeasible. In a triangular distribution, I can cap and floor the margin. So in my case, it, the best, my best margin can be 35%, my worst margin is, is, is 15%, my expected value is 25%. So note that my expected values for revenue growth and margins are the same as I had my base case, but I've now introduced distributions for those variables. I stopped and thought about constraints, and with Apple, I couldn't think of any serious big constraints. Apple doesn't have a whole lot of debt to worry about, not, no big debt payments, no regulatory constraints. But I did build in a correlation between revenue growth and operating margin. Remember, the number was 0.63 going back to 1989. But if you look at the last decade with the iPhone, the correlation has become much weaker. So I did lower that number to 0.50, but I'm building in still the likelihood that if margins, if revenue growth is high, margins are more likely to be high than low in terms of the outcomes. I'm getting ready to run my distribution and here's where life has gotten a lot simpler in the last decade. As I said 20 or 30 years ago you'd have had to find a mainframe and pay oodles of money to get the simulation run but now if you have Excel installed and unfortunately you need the PC version of Excel. I'm a Mac user so I have to kind of open up the Mac and PC in, in PC format and run the simulation. There are a couple of interesting add-ons that allow you to run simulations at almost no effort. The add-on that I, I've used is Crystal Ball, which is an Oracle product, which adds a menu item to Excel. So basically, this is what the Excel menu items look like in the PC version of Excel. And once you've added Crystal Ball, notice it's a menu item. If you open the menu item, it actually allows you to pick the distributions for the variables, define the output variable, which would be value per share for Apple, the default number of simulations is 100,000. The minute you hit the green arrow, the simulations start running. Now, incidentally, there is a second product that I've heard good things about called Atresk, which I have not used. But Crystal Ball, I can attest to. I can also tell you that I get no, no, in fact, I pay for my version of Crystal Ball. There's no sponsorship fee or advertising revenues I'm getting from it. So you don't feel the urge to use Crystal Ball just because I suggested it. Try it out. There's a trial version you can, you can download and play with. Now, once I run Crystal Ball, I get a distribution of value for Apple. Remember the expected value was 126 in my base case valuation. This is my distribution of values across the simulation. My expected value is close to 126, which is what I got. My average value across the simulation was about 126, close to my expected value. No surprise there. My median value is actually a little lower, 123. But here's the interesting thing. There are lots of things I can learn from just looking at that distribution. My worst case value is about $81. So could Apple still be overvalued? Yes.
but there's only about a 7% chance. All you have to do is count the number of outcomes below 93, which was the price when I did this valuation. My best case value is 415. Is there a very, very tiny chance of that happening? But my 90th percentile is about 157, and my 10th percentile is about $99. Remember, this is about making decisions you feel comfortable. I feel comfortable investing in Apple at $93 given this distribution. In fact, remember the margin of safety, the webcast I did last? If you're still attached to the margin of safety, you can actually use simulations to make the margin of safety a flexible. You can make it a flexible approach where you use the distribution you get from the simulation to decide what the margin of safety will be for your company. So I find this a way in which, I, the way I describe this is with simulations, you get a chance to look at uncertainty in the face. And you know what? Once you look at it in the face, it's not as scary as it is when you hide from it. So to me, simulations are a way that I get more comfortable with valuations. I'm not going to do anything crazy with that output from the simulation. It's true, it is still based on subjective judgments about distributions but it's at least an attempt on my part to deal with uncertainty in a healthy way. So my suggestion is the next time you do a DCF valuation, add a simulation to it. Download a trial version of Crystal Ball and try it out. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, move on. That's it. Thank you very much for listening.